And we have with us a special guest to speak on education and that's uh, of course vital these days because uh, the second phase is just about to commence in terms of reopening schools and uh, this of course is at a higher level right now. And we have with us Professor Anand Jawadana, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Moratua and currently a Commission Member of the University Grants Commission and also a senior professor or senior lecturer at the Moratua University and the former Director General of National Science Foundation. So he has plenty of experience as a lecturer in engineering and of course we are here to talk about that topic and plans uh, which would actually help the kids out there, the students out there to select the best uh, stream they would like to pick and since the COVID pandemic was around the corner and we're still trying to recover and we need to focus on education which is vital. So a very good morning to you Professor. Very good morning to you and Sharifa. And we're honored to have you here with us on our morning show to talk about some important topics which uh, matter the most at this crucial period. So, Professor, first and foremost, let's uh, talk about yourself and a lecturer, uh, your experiences as a lecturer, uh, and you've been doing that for several years. I graduated from University of Moratua in 1985. Um, 85 and then I joined the University of Moratu as a assistant lecturer so right throughout my career I was at the University of Moratu doing postgraduates overseas and um, I'm a, at the moment a senior professor in civil engineering so it's a progressive development uh, from lecturer uh, assistant lecturer to a senior lecturer you know associate professor professor senior lecturer but mainly I have been holding many administrative positions at the University of Moratu heads of two departments management of technology civil engineering and then the dean faculty of engineering and then the vice chancellor for six years so uh, was involved in... Uh, it's not an easy journey. <laughs> definitely, yes. So you've got to climb the ladder and you've done that step by step. So being a lecturer for so many years, obviously you're dealing with a lot of kids and a lot of uh, children who are different, obviously. So how is it like your experience as a lecturer from day one up to now? Has it changed? Because obviously with technology, things have changed. So how have you moved forward? Obviously, you know, during our time, you know, we didn't even have photocopiers and, um, you know, we didn't have any kind of audio visual equipment or anything like that. So, but if you consider now, it is essential that we should embrace all the technologies that are available because we need to make sure when the students graduate, especially in um, professional degrees like engineering, that uh, uh, they need to have certain attributes uh, to work in the industry, particularly if you want to obtain international accreditation and so on. So it is a must that we need to ensure that we use all these modern facilities and they are very productive and they provide repeated learning for students until they really master the subject. And uh, so we have been at Morato, we have been progressively improving all the aspects and we can proudly say that um, we are using up-to-date, latest state-of-the-art kind of uh, technologies in teaching. And I think uh, this would be good advice for all the budding teachers out there to keep with the trend. And uh, Definitely, I think it is very important now because uh, we had this COVID pandemic and uh, obviously uh, we at the UGC also, we encouraged all the vice chancellors, deans and the lecturers to make use of the online technologies during this time when the students are at home because we need to productively use this time and we know that when students enter the university is already too late as well so we need to productively use this time so i think universities tried hard to use these facilities and many lecturers conducted their lectures online and even some examinations to a certain extent yeah and since uh, you are currently a commission member of the University Grants Commission, I think it's appropriate to ask this question from you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the activities uh, conducted by the Grants Commission and how you kind of managed everything during the COVID pandemic lockdown. University Grants Commission is uh, 
as the name implies, it's actually providing grants. It coordinates the grants to various universities depending on their requirements. So it provides both capital grants and recurrent grant, and it supports all the development of infrastructure, facilities, equipment, and all that in the universities uh, with the limited funding that we get. And um, of course, the universities are supposed to request uh, based on their short-term plan, medium and long-term plans, what kind of developments that they need. And uh, so that's that's a grant side. But then we have a very, very important aspect of regulating and assuring quality of higher education. So uh, when we consider regulating, we need to have a consistent policy for each and every aspect. Um, when we have administration, uh, the teaching part, the you know human resource uh, management, all of them. So I think mainly it provides that regulatory and consistent consistent part so that we know that every university has a similar kind of processes uh, uh, to make sure that there is uniform standard. So so we, we are a policy making body in that context and we provide circulars, um, you know, rules and regulations for the universities for their administration and functioning. So in, in very brief that and on top of that, the University Grants Commission has a quality assurance council and that ensures that each of the programs conducted by the universities um, has uh, necessary quality in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the human resources, in terms of the way the subject is delivered, in terms of the students grasping of the subject. So all these aspects are actually considered and provides a certain kind of a ranking uh, to ensure that uh, and, and also recommendations to further improve. So that that's a very important aspect as well. And um, then you need to certainly provide the opportunities to explore expand higher education and provide opportunities for all the students uh, who actually satisfy a level so university entrance so we are not doing that at the moment with the limited spaces and um, that is a, one of the main functions that we are looking uh, into to see how best we can expand the higher education as well so these are the basic functions that we do at the university grants commission so that's basically the activities of the UGC in a nutshell Yes. And uh, let's talk about how the UGC, UGC was working during the lockdown. During the lockdown, the University Grants Commission um, maintained all the kind of communications uh, through online, you know, various technologies, uh, conference uh, online technologies like Zoom and things like that, or Microsoft Teams and, you know, things like that. So we continue to have our commission meetings and the management meetings during that time. And um, we communicated with the universities is uh, online and um through emails and through distance mode delivery and things like that um, to provide necessary instructions. So during this time, we promoted all the vice chancellors. Even we had the online meetings with the vice chancellors as well. Uh, we wanted the universities to use this time very productively. So uh, we were trying to provide these kind of facilities necessary as well. Uh, so um, during this time, we really, of course, there was a disturbance, obviously, because it's not 100% efficiency. Uh, you know like normal time uh, but we I think use the time as much as possible productively to do administration work and things like that so when staff don't come initially right but subsequently of course we engage with the staff online uh, we in fact took a decision that we need to provide further facilities for staff members uh, to work at home when there is a situation like that so that you know uh, we, we can productively use their time and the expertise exactly now you did speak about how the administration worked in terms of uh, working on further enhancing whatever is available at the commission uh, through video conference calls and all that. So speaking of technology, I think uh, it's vital to uh, touch on this as well because main focus are the students. So we are here to educate the students as the commission and even the rest of the universities in Sri Lanka. So we don't see every student who has access to technology. So there are students who come into universities from rural areas. There are students who don't have enough sufficient fund to actually go online and make use of all those facilities. So the new norm is different right now because when it comes to a period with no pandemic, students can 
physically enter classrooms and be educated. But whereas in this sort of situation, they need to stay at home and study. So there are students who are unable to do that. So did the administration come to a decision as to how they should change this norm? Yes, this is a gap that we need to really fulfill to a certain degree. However, we knew that, you know, we, we, we know that the universities already have their main platforms to provide online teaching. So for example, we call it a learning management system and uh, through that uh, every lecturer can upload their materials in uh, various forms like a PowerPoint presentation or videos or any kind of a way uh, you can upload. So we have been, some universities have been using these kind of dual mode, uh, you know, hybrid kind of uh, uh, technologies, uh, I mean, course delivery in that context. However, some universities, uh, you know, did not use this very productively earlier in the past. As you said, of course, um, if you consider the students uh, throughout the country, particularly when they were staying at home during the COVID period, uh, some students actually had some problems of uh, internet connectivity and uh, you know, um, you know, their devices and things like that. So what we are, what we have done is, um, I think, with the intervention of His Excellency the President and also the UGC officials and the uh, uh, service providers, you know, we uh, you know decided to get their services to enhance and in fact service providers indicated that you know let us know the areas where you have uh, poor signals so that you know we can enhance uh, uh, signal strength uh, in these kind of areas so this will uh, continue to ensure that you know throughout the country uh, you have these kind of uh, signal strengths and uh, when it comes to devices uh, certainly of course for online teaching you need to have a, a device right at least a smartphone and uh, we found that uh, not every student has a laptop right but uh, all Almost every student has a smartphone, smart device, right? So we have been using those kind of things, uh, you know, facilities available with the students. Um, they, of course, some of them said that, you know, uh, sometimes it is difficult to access and things like that. And uh, so this is an area that we continue to see uh, to ensure that the students have devices. In fact, the UGC wanted to introduce, in fact, we'll take action to ensure that when a university student comes to the university, for their studies you know at the very beginning every university must have this kind of a device so the students who are unable to afford that kind of a device the government is actually uh, trying to introduce a loan scheme and uh, to see uh, that uh, we have local manufacturers who can really assemble these kind of devices to suit various requirements in some courses you might not need an advanced device maybe some courses you need so we will identify these kind of different specifications required for these devices and uh, we are promoting some manufacturers local manufacturers to assemble these devices so that the students uh, uh, are given a loan and uh, the loan can be paid when they are employed after passing out the university so these kind of uh, plans are already uh, you know in the pipeline okay so that's in terms of how you could get the students involved with technology and to continue uh, teaching them the best so we'll touch on uh, the recent activities of the UGC and also about uh, introductory courses and all that. And uh, we spoke about uh, what the University Grants Commission has been up to during the lockdown and also about uh, the activities uh, the grants does, the commission does in a nutshell. And uh, right now, uh, let's touch about the expansion of education, which is vital. So uh, let's talk about what the commission has planned in terms of this. Sure, if, if you consider the expansion of education, I think it is uh, really important because um, if you consider A-level students, the number of students who pass the A-levels, that is to satisfy the university entrance, that is with three ASAs, is very large, about 150,000 students. But the state university system can accommodate only about 31,000 students according to last year's statistics. So there is a huge need to expand higher education. Yes, and obviously. If, when you said that my the question running in my head was what happens to the rest you know they are going some of them are going to the technical colleges and the lower level education and some going abroad and consuming our hard earned foreign exchange and whereas we can provide those kind of opportunities in Sri Lanka we have talents without any issue so this is uh, uh, I mean if you consider the you know His Excellency's uh, you know vistas of prosperity 
I mean, he has categorically indicated that we need to provide this kind of education. And if you can compare with the regional countries, um, you know, we are providing this higher education to a very small percentage. And uh, this is a, a hindrance to the economic development of a country, right? So you, you, we can boast about our literacy rate. Primary education is excellent in Sri Lanka. But if you consider the higher education, university degrees is a very small percentage. And with that kind of a percentage, it's very difficult uh, for us to have a knowledge economy in the country and to support the economic development of a country. So it is in that context that we are actually looking into the possibilities of higher education expansion. UGC is very keen in doing that. Already, you know, even during the COVID time, we have been actually, you know, toiling um, uh, to see how best we can do it. And we have already initiated a change in the Universities Act, which is very, very old. And, um, you know, that was established, uh, you know, uh, when uh, we had only about six, seven universities. And now we need flexibility. We need uh, autonomy in the universities. We need uh, uh, flexibility to start higher education institutions and so on. So there'll be a new act coming up to facilitate this kind of expansion as well. And um, so in addition to expanding students to state universities already existing, there'll be some new uh, concepts coming up as well. Say, say for example, uh, there'll be a university, um, you know, plans are afford for university for nursing, university for sports and university for education and to provide, you know, you know, developed education list. And also the UGC has a concept and also based on the vistas of prosperity to establish, uh, say, city universities. It basically, you identify key cities in Sri Lanka and these universities will not have uh, hostels and things like that because uh, most of the students will be attracted in those kind of districts and the courses are more more relevant to the needs of the district's development, economic development, creation and employment, entrepreneurship and things like that. So this uh, already the action has been initiated to you know establish this kind of university. So that is uh, one aspect in locally. And then um, also we will facilitate non-state sector providers uh, to link up with the state sector or even otherwise uh, to provide higher education opportunities because if you consider a developing country like Sri Lanka, uh, it is not possible for us to expect the government to provide all the opportunities for higher education. And it is it is not the case if you consider any any country in the world, even, you know, countries which are poorer than Sri Lanka has many opportunities uh, with the private sector participation. What is important is that we need to make sure that the quality is delivered and quality assurance is there. So that's, I think, is a regulatory function. The uni University Grants Commission will be very keen to make sure that this kind of quality assurance is maintained and uh, there will be an independent quality assurance body coming up to ensure the quality is maintained both in state and higher education, uh, non-state education institutions and um, so these are the aspects. Also there will be incentives to attract foreign university uh, degree providers to Sri Lanka, you know, link up with local universities uh, to offer joint degrees and joint programs and uh, maybe even international national degrees uh, while studying in Sri Lanka. So these are all the different ways of providing, um, you know, expanding higher education. So the UGC is now developing in addition to doing the routine maintenance, maintenance and the regulatory functions. But we are now looking into a holistic development of the entire higher education sector, specifically to make sure that we have uh, expanding opportunities for higher education and the quality assurance, employability, entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. As you did mention that uh, teaming up with the private sector is also important over here because we see many students who are actually schooling privately as well, and they also need to have a scope in the country rather than obviously going abroad or seeking education in other countries. Definitely. So like... Uh, you know, there's medical tourism. We could also have educate tourism in terms of education. So are we looking at that aspect as well? Yeah, if you consider Sri Lanka and um, and the parents of Sri Lanka as well, you know, they have this uh, a great desire to educate their children. I think uh, Sri Lanka has a, a very good e ecosystem for education, you know. So, um, I mean, we have a talent 
pool in Sri Lanka in, in many aspects and we are connected globally uh, through the universities and having you know their PhDs all around the world and things like that so we have a, a very good resource base in Sri Lanka uh, what we need is the the flexibility and opportunity to expand and uh, so we can as you said we can really export education right so basically you know we are talking about exports product services mm-hmm. and things like that education is a service we can export and earn quite a lot of money and and foreign exchange providing the opportunities without sacrificing the employment market here in Sri Lanka. So this is an area that we have, uh, you know, late to consider. And um, I, I think we together, we, we need to provide this opportunity to ensure while we provide education opportunities for our own kids in Sri Lanka, we need to attract other you know, regional and foreign uh, students to Sri Lanka to provide the education so that we can, you know, support the economy through that aspect. Exactly. And, uh, well, I was also informed about an English course, uh, which would be conducted very soon in partnership with many organizations. Do you wish to elaborate on this? This is basically, uh, as you very well know, that English is very, very important if you consider the employability of graduates and uh, both state sector and mainly the private sector and also if you consider the global employment market it is essential that irrespective of the type of the course that you follow the degree that you earn the communication in English is very very important and um, we have uh, learned in the past uh, that even you know after getting a university degree you know our graduates uh, cannot speak very well or cannot communicate so this is a shortcoming that we have identified and there is a direct correlation relation between the communication skills and the employability of the graduates as well. So in order to ensure that we have actually mm, taken several initiatives, one is that uh, we want to introduce a, a uniform uh, standard for English uh, through an examination called UTEL, which is a university testing of English language. And this is going to be a national testing service. Uh, like IELTS in the British Council where you have identified certain skills and competency bands up to about nine bands and uh, then uh, this examination will be conducted by a central place and um, you know as far as possible through online the uh, other components like speaking and listening with face-to-face kind of a thing so very soon actually action has already been initiated to establish this center in the Columbia University already we have identified the core staff and very soon this center will be established there and uh, managed by the University Grants Commission and it is a qualification given by the Grants Commission and the Ministry uh, like a standard qualification for students with a certificate and uh, the students the universities will specify the kind of competencies required for different types of courses say for example in engineering you can say that you must have a UTEL band 7 or uh, 7 or 8 qualification before you pass out from uh, you know from the university uh, maybe arts and humanities degree you can have a UTEL band you must have this one before you pass out so, so it, the, it depends it varies from uh, your area can can criteria. can vary like that yeah. it depends on the competence that you need you have in your graduates of course one day you know we will decide everybody should have this kind of competencies because that is the kind of a target that we need to achieve so providing education for this one is basically rest with the department of english uh, teaching at the universities another step the ugc has taken is basically to convert the units teaching english in the universities to specialized departments so that they can really focus they can expand their cadre and they can expand their education uh, provision uh, so that uh, you know these uh, students can be given a better education so there'll be we have already established the department of english language teaching in all the universities in the relevant faculty at the moment so that is one aspect so I would like to also discuss about this pre-university English um, because uh, Sharifa at the moment you know uh, students have to stay for a long time in th- at home before they really come and commence their studies at the university. This is something that the University Grants Commission is addressing at the moment in two fronts. One is basically to reduce this gap that is after releasing the results 
when the students start their course at the university there is a period of about a one year so which is obviously very very long and we need to reduce this one to three to four months right so that's the whole idea of that so we are we have already initiated action to see how best we reduce this uh, you know while improving our systems of selections within the university automating certain functions checking on verifying the documents and also linking up with the department of examinations to see how best they can release the results and uh, you know recorrection and things like that so we'll continue to uh, provide our services to ensure that this is reduced in addition to that while the students are waiting at home we are now contemplating to introduce an online pre-university english program and uh, initially that will be offered to all the university selectees at the moment we are developing that program we have already taken action to develop it and uh, so this is a kind of a program where uh, you provide all the teaching lesson materials through online right to, through distance learning e-learning and all that without using any papers or anything like that so this applies to the rural areas yes, as yes, well yes exactly and we 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 are looking into this uh, uh, aspects of filling the gaps like mm-hmm. you know enhancing connectivity uh, you know how to connect with the open university regional centers if there are no devices or you know internet bandwidth so we request them to come to those kind of centers or we have nano sellers so we will see how best we can overcome these kind of shortcomings that we face but uh, the program we are going to introduce in about three months time right so basically by that time the program will be led ready and at the moment already uh, we are in the process of uh, recruiting staff members to develop these programs consultants have already been selected and uh, so by october by early september this program will be ready and we will open it up for all the university selectees they are following this program for this standard you tell test and that is an incentive for the students to you know learn english to for this unified or standard qualification and um, when so is f- this internationally uh, recognized as well that is what we are actually trying to now align uh, we have identified that in order to ensure the students have a certificate which is internationally recognized we are trying to align this youth tell with international standard right it can be british council uh, ilts examination or it can be any other international examination so at the moment uh, there is this utel steering committee at the university grants commission uh, they are looking into the possibility of aligning this one with the international standard this is something that we will make sure that it will happen because uh, we don't want our students to sit for another examination and things like that so it's a motivation for the student to really get a uh you know certificate at a certain band level composite certificate with different skills and things like that so these are all the plans are worked out and then we need to really implement them obviously awareness is also key now that uh, we are mentioning about this on radio i guess we reach out to a certain extent so how do you intend to spread the word apart from this <laughs> Yeah okay right so we expect you to provide that kind of a services <laughs> as well as you quite rightly indicated but we are, are taking some actions uh, you know to uh, uh, ensure that this is communicated uh, through the universities through our websites and uh, uh, we will also see the possibility of providing uh, you know press conferences and uh, specialized kind of programs to ensure that the students are, are made aware of uh, these kind of programs that we are trying to introduce With that it's time for us to wrap up this uh, segment and move on to music once again. So thank you very much to Professor Ananda Jawadana for being a part of the show. It was really nice talking to you and thank you for enlightening all the students and obviously parents and teachers out there as to what's in store in the future in terms of education. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.